Horizon Zero Dawn was a game that took the world by storm. At the time that it launched, it looked a little cool, but little was certain. Leading up to the game's launch, we had seen a few trailers that looked promising. A young girl that was chasing down robot dinosaurs, shooting them with a bow and arrow for some reason instead of a gun. It seemed interesting. Furthermore, the game was also gorgeous. It was running on, of course, the PlayStation 4 and was using the Decima engine, which was marketed as the next evolution of gaming technology. And this seemed to be a little bit more than just marketing jargon because, of course, this is the same engine that Hideo Kojima would go on to use for Death Stranding, a game that was heavily lauded for its realistic graphics. However, there was a concern as to whether or not Horizon Zero Dawn would be able to deliver on its key premise. I mean, after all, Ninja Theory had released a very, very similar game just a few years prior called Enslaved Odyssey to the West. This was a game that also had a female protagonist where you were hunting down robot dinosaurs. And of course, once we actually played that game, we saw that they were quite different at the end stage, but nonetheless, at the surface, they seemed to be very similar games. Now, there was nothing shady here. And of course, Gorilla wasn't trying to copy Ninja Theory whatsoever. Horizon Zero Dawn had actually actually been well beyond the concept phase for a while by the time that Ninja Theory announced that game. The point is that it left a lot of people scratching their heads and chins and other stuff, wondering whether or not Horizon Zero Dawn was completely original and whether or not it would be able to deliver on that promise. Because after all, many people felt as though Ninja Theory's take on this type of game fell pretty flat. But perhaps the coup de grace behind all of this was that Horizon Zero Dawn seemed to have the ultimate endorsement possible. Sony. Of course, Guerrilla Games is underneath the Sony umbrella of first party studios, but nonetheless, they received complete and unwavering marketing support from Sony corporate from the game's announcement all the way through to its launch. We're talking about tens upon tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of marketing that they got simply for being a member of the Sony Interactive Entertainment team of studios. That is something that many publishers and many developers would kill to have at their disposal. But just like we saw with Hello Games' is fantastically well received game No Man's Sky, this marketing machine isn't always enough to make a game successful, at least in the long run. In the case of No Man's Sky, hype was there. Lots of people were very excited for it. However, it fell flat because the game was terrible. And you've got to bear in mind that Horizon Zero Dawn launched in a very interesting time. It was, of course, right around the launch of the Nintendo Switch, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, but it was also right after the debacle that was No Man's Sky, just six to eight months after. Sony's overpromising when it came to No Man's Sky was fresh on everybody's minds. We were all well aware that Sony was perfectly capable of overhyping a game, getting us all excited for all of these things that they were promising, only to deliver a game that was unable to bring those things to the table. And when it came to Horizon Zero Dawn, there were many things that were being promised and discussed. This game seemed as though it came out of nowhere. Many people hadn't played the Killzone games and didn't know Guerrilla's previous work. As far as they were concerned, this was a game that came out of left field completely by surprise. And all of a sudden, they were promising that this was going to be a next generation RPG action adventure game with a gripping story, a strong empowered female protagonist, robot dinosaurs, everything you could possibly want. Sorry, I got a little excited there. I'll calm down. The point is, a lot of people were skeptical, and rightly so. But based on what we were shown, the game had, in a word, potential. Now games like Horizon Zero Dawn have to do a few things really well to be successful. Specifically, when they're an open world action adventure, RPG, bloody blue de blah blah character soup game, they have to have an interesting world, they have to have an engaging gameplay loop, and they have to have a story that justifies those two pieces. If any of these three fail, the game will, almost without exception, flop. But again, it's important to also remember the time at which this game launched. And I know all of this sounds easier said than done, but having an interesting world is a lot harder 
to do than you might initially think. I mean, if I asked you to simply explain what makes an interesting world, I would wager a pretty hefty bet that you would have trouble putting into words, at the very least concisely, what makes an interesting game world. And of course, when it comes to an engaging gameplay loop, that's something that developers spend years trying to perfect and often fail because it's only games that do it phenomenally well that are phenomenally well received. And of course, these things have to work in tandem. If they don't, you end up with an interesting world, but no interesting means of exploring it, which hinders the world's progression, your way of exploring it or interacting with that world. It just doesn't make sense. And furthermore, you can have a fantastic gameplay loop, but if the world is painfully uninteresting, you will have no incentive to continue exploring it, trying to find new things to engage with. It, it just doesn't work. But beyond these things, it's also important to match the time at which the game is launching. 2016 is different than 17 is different than 2020. You need to make sure that the game fits with the zeitgeist of that year and of the clientele you're targeting. To be specific, Horizon Zero Dawn launched in the window of Breath of the Wild and the Switch's launch. As we're seeing now, new console launches are actually pretty tricky for gamers. I mean, everybody wants to be on the newest and greatest console and the newest and greatest thing, but not everyone can be, especially when scalpers are out there buying up all of the inventory. Yes, I'm still pissed. No, I don't have a PS5. You see, it's, it's not just you guys. Even YouTubers are pissed because they can't get it. I'm not joking. I've tried so much. I've ordered them. I've gotten it in my cart. I even had it checked out through Kohl's and they canceled it three days late. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm upset and I'm going to move on because that's not what this video is about. <laughs> and like being honest, you're probably watching this in like a few weeks or months or years, whatever it is. High from the past, by the way. And by now, I'm sure you can go in and just get a PS5 off the shelf and it's no big issue. But as of right now, it's terrible and I can't find one and I'm sad about it. The point is, not everybody can be on the Nintendo Switch on launch day playing Breath of the Wild. So it's important to make sure that you can present an opportunity for someone else or another product in this case to swoop in and save those customers. Give them something to engage with and hopefully turn them into fans. Or, I mean, at the very least, customers, but let's not get greedy. I mean, I remember back in 2017 trying to go and hunt down a Nintendo Switch only to give up defeated. My refuge and escape? Horizon Zero Dawn. It was a pleasant coincidence for Guerrilla Games, I'm sure. They definitely didn't plan on releasing right before the Switch's launch, but I think they actually probably benefited from it. Though, of course, I will admit that I have no metrics or stats to back up this point. It's just something that I feel is justifiable based on everything I know about the game's launch. But that brings us to the game's launch. It's in people's homes. It's on their consoles. They boot it up for the first time. It begs the obvious question, was the game good? And I think the best way to approach this is to break it down from the start of the game. Horizon Zero Dawn opens up on a young Aloy. We don't get to know much about her other than that she is an outcast from a tribe that seems to have some sort of high standing in the community. Or perhaps it's a better way of saying that it is the community and she's been cast out of it, even though she seems to be, I, I don't know, eight, maybe nine years old here. I, I'm gonna be honest, her head is like super misshapen. It's one of the first things I noticed when I played the game for the first time. It looks like they took an adult model and character skeleton and then just like shrunk down everything but scaled up the head weirdly. Like, I don't know what it is. The proportions of all the kids in this game are really, really weird. I also, I have no idea how old she's supposed to be here, maybe seven? Does that sound better? I don't know. Every time I put an age on her, I, it sounds weird. So I'm just going to say, we're, we'll say 53. She's 53. Now, right off the bat, we don't get to find out much about Aloy, but from what we can see, she's fairly rambunctious. She knows what she wants, she knows what she believes, and she's going to do what she wants. She is a strong-spirited child, as it were. I don't know why that was in a British accent. I'm sorry. Now, whether she was pushed out from the tribe for not having a mother or some other crime, at this point, we don't really know. We'll find out later exactly what went on, but as of right now, it just seems as though she's a young girl 
that's out alone and outcast because of something beyond her control, which makes us immediately feel as though she's a victim. However, it's important to stress that Aloy doesn't seem to feel like a victim. She might occasionally feel a little bad for herself or express frustration with how she's being treated, but in general, she tends to pull herself back up and get back to work. She definitely doesn't wallow in her own misery and suffering. She figures it out and moves on. Now she's living with a guy named Rost, who's apparently her guardian. He's also an outcast and it's unclear exactly what their relationship is or how they might be related or how they ended up in this situation together, but it seems pretty safe to assume that Rost has basically assumed the role of her father figure. Now in the first few minutes of gameplay, Aloy finds what's called a focus device. It's a small augmented reality headset thingy that serves as the in-game UI. Now, based on my research of the game's development, this actually wasn't in the game this early initially. They were going to actually introduce it after the proving. It was going to be one of the rewards to the player for having gotten through the prologue of the game a couple hours or three hours into the title. However, as development went on, they realized that it was going to be pretty difficult to let the player play through the game for two to three hours, all the while withholding the UI and all of those graphical elements from the player, only to introduce it after the three hour mark it, it seemed as though it was going to add to a lot more trouble than it was worth. Basically, what they found during their focus testing was that players felt as though they had started a new game once they got the focus. And in some cases, they even preferred to not have the focus at all because they had grown accustomed to Aloy without it. And to be honest, I think that this is a perfectly fair estimation on the part of those focus testers. If I started playing a game, got three hours into it, comfortable with the gameplay loop that had been established to get something thrown at me where they introduced detective modes and all these other things in a game that totals around 25 to 30 hours seems a little rich. The point is, they ended up scooting it all the way up to this point, so it's one of the first things that you do. You pick up the focus device, and immediately it makes Aloy special. Throughout the rest of the game, the only people that use focuses are people in a privileged situation. Very few people find these things functioning, and even fewer use them. The writers explain most of this away by saying that many members of the Nora tribe, if not all of them, believe that technology such as this should be forbidden and left alone simply because it is from the old world. It's not for them to engage with. However, once again, Aloy doesn't care. She's going to do what she wants and they can get over it. Furthermore, she was also cast out, so who gives a crap what the Nora tribe thinks of her using a focus device? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Rost initially pushes back and says that she should get rid of it and that it's not for her to use, or it's a toy, it's a dinghy, it's a waste of time, but he immediately sees that it's special to her, so he gives up that fight pretty much immediately. Part of the reason that Aloy feels an attachment to this device and feels as though she needs to keep it indefinitely is because the first thing that she sees with it is a happy birthday message from a father speaking to his son. It's a cute little holographic moment and her reaction tells us everything about her current situation. She's lonely, she seeks that sort of familial relationship, caring, loving, and unbiased affection, it's something that she's just not getting, and it's something she wants desperately. It's not to say that Rost doesn't care about her, but it is to say that Rost doesn't know how to love her or care for her in this way, and perhaps it's not even his place to love and care for her in that way, Nonetheless, it seems as though he's tough love and she wants more of a caring father figure. However, as the intro goes along, we'll see that Ross starts to open up and figure out how to properly handle Aloy. It's not clear exactly how long they've been outcast at the start of the game when we first take control of Aloy, but at the very least, it's safe to assume that he's been out there for a hot minute, maybe even years with her, so he should know her better than this. He should know what she needs, but 
Even so, it's perhaps not that important. Later, we also see Aloy interact with some small children who are members of the Nora tribe. It's also our first chance to make a branching decision, and I put that in heavy quotation marks because it really doesn't do much. I'll address it more in a little bit, but do not be under any misconception. This is not an RPG with a ton of branching narratives. That's not what they're here to do. That's not the story they're telling and in effect, this choice has very little to do with how the rest of the game is going to play out. If anything, it just sets the tone for the player to think about these characters moving forward. But once again, we'll talk about that more in detail later. I do want to make sure that I note that this tone for me made me really hate these kids. They're just being cruel, throwing rocks and things at Aloy, even though she did nothing wrong. She committed no sin and yet she's being punished for it. It made me want revenge for Aloy. But to what extent that will go and what impact that will have on the story, we shall see very shortly. Now, almost immediately, Aloy decides that she's going to start training for a competition called The Proving. And basically, this is an event that will allow the victor to become a brave or in this case, a member of the Nora tribe. So we see a montage of Aloy training and preparing for this proving over the course of the next 10 years or so as she goes through her teen years and early adulthood. And this actually justifies her abnormally fantastic skill at climbing and shooting and fighting and almost everything else. It's a small thing, but I actually really like it when there's a reason that a character is able to do what they do in the gameplay loop. An example of when this is done terribly would be something like in Fallout 4. If you select the female character, she's a lawyer, and she's supposed to be able to come out of this cryogenic slumber and immediately operate a pistol, rifle, plasma gun, everything with ease, even though she was a lawyer. Whereas on the contrary, if you choose to play as the male character, his backstory is as a former soldier. So it makes more sense that he would be familiar with these weapons, at the very least, to an extent beyond that of a lawyer. And that's when we enter the first phase of the game when it really opens up and lets you take complete control of the character. You have access to a small chunk of the map here in what is considered to be a safe area. There's a few roaming robots, but really nothing that intimidating or scary, and it just allows the player the chance to get their feet under them. You go around hunting, completing some side quests, gathering a ton of stuff, upgrading your equipment if you can, and if you gather enough gear and then eventually you actually are taken by Rost in the middle of the night to go and uh, let's say refine your skills before the big event the following day. Quick little note, the weather in this footage is super dreary. But in my other runs, it's actually very clear and bright here. So it's a dynamic weather system that's at play here, and it actually dramatically changes the tone of this entire sequence. It's actually pretty cool. I love that they're able to do this, but it, it's just fun to me to see how much a dynamic weather system can change how the player feels about a narrative beat. It, it's, it's super cool to me. Now, as Rost takes Aloy outside of the established barriers the night before the proving, it seems as though he wants to have a heart to heart with her. He wants to give her the chance to prove herself once and for all that she's ready for the proving, but I can't help but feel as though this is a weird time for it. Maybe it's a last ditch effort at him bonding with her. Maybe it's just one last chance for her to refine her skills. It's a little strange, narratively speaking. I'm not sure how this is justified by way of the characters. But when it comes to the gameplay, this is a pretty cool moment. You hunt a sawtooth. The reveal is super dramatic and it works really well. I will always remember the first time I saw a sawtooth here and I absolutely loved it. The thing looks scary as hell. And even though it's on a very simplistic route, going basically just in a giant circle, I remember being terrified of engaging with this thing the first time I played the game. Once you get all the way through the game, this seems like a really perhaps overly simplistic encounter that is a walk in the park to handle. However, this first time, just like Aloy, the player is going to find themselves very intimidated and borderline scared. I've said it before, I love it when the player and the character 
find themselves experiencing the same emotion. I think it's something that only video games can really do to this crazy extent to the point where you are truly terrified and scared of engaging with this creature because you're scared of losing your progress because you're scared of wasting your time. I, I just think it's so cool when the player and the player character are on the same page. I think it's a little taste of gaming magic. Okay, fine, I'll get off my soapbox. I, I just, I find it cool. Now, the first time I went through this, I tried meleeing a ton and it didn't work well at all. However, once you're familiar with the game, you'll find yourself setting some traps and then luring the Sawtooth into those traps for an easy kill. It's actually kind of stupid easy once you tee up these traps and it, it's just, an example of becoming very familiar with the gameplay loop and then going back through and seeing how far not just your character progressed, but how far you as a player have progressed as well. Now after this, you get some more hunting that you can engage with and you explore the small section of the map that you have access to a little bit more. A few things popped into my mind as I went through this section, namely that it seemed as though hunting was very underutilized, specifically animal hunting. There would be ways perhaps of doing a hunting system for the bots that didn't just provide scrap metal and materials for crafting and upgrading your gear, but perhaps even a trophy system, perhaps a really unique form of a sawtooth and a really unique form of the watchers. Something that makes them special, maybe they're white, maybe they're chrome, they have some sort of special gear that makes it worth hunting them down. In other words, the same type of trophy system that was employed in a game such as Red Dead Redemption 2. I think that can encourage the player to go exploring, trying to find this very rare creature and hunt them down, even though it's going to be a more difficult encounter. The other thing I noticed was that in the distance, there was a large snake looking robot buried inside the mountain. Immediately, I thought to myself, I wonder if I can climb that damn thing. So, I decided to try. As I marched over towards that spider looking thing, I felt very confident that Todd Howard would be very proud of me if he were here in this moment right now. You look off in the distance, you see something, you can climb it, you can go there, as long as you can see it. I was pretty sure I was gonna be able to find some way to climb up this thing because it was so visually appealing and interesting. I, I just had to assume that there was some way to engage with it, but Unfortunately, it is purely set dressing. There is one that you can find later and climb later in the story towards the end, but really, as of right now, in this level, it's just set dressing. If you get up to the base of the mountain and try to climb up it, you can't. There's invisible walls all over the place, something I absolutely abhor when it comes to open world action RPGs that claim to be about adventure. I think it's just terrible. Awful. No invisible walls. Stop it. But after this, I kept exploring, running around. I completed Thok side quest, which grants a damage increase to your spear, which is pretty helpful, especially in the coming combat sequences. But it seems as though this was initially designed as some sort of incentive to continue with side quests, because if you follow certain side quests, you can find yourself getting damage perks and boosts to your core melee weapon, which seems like a pretty important feature, something you definitely need to do. If you don't go and engage with these side quests, you'll find yourself with a base leveled spear throughout the first half of the game or so, which is why it's surprising to me that these side quests aren't pushed anywhere near as much as you would expect. Yeah, they're around, and if you choose to engage with them, you will, but at the end of the day, it's really up to the player to engage with these weapon upgrade side quests. And if they choose not to, or if they're just oblivious and don't realize that this is even a thing, they're just out of luck. Now, of course, I like the option to engage with the side quests. After all, if you have a mandatory side quest, it's no longer really a side quest. It's more of a primary quest, to be honest. My point is that I feel as though something like this is very important, and you should probably communicate it to the player. Maybe there's some message or prompt that I didn't get in my most recent playthrough that says players need to engage with side quests to upgrade their spear fully. I, I don't know if that's in there. If it is, let me know. 
But all I know is in this particular playthrough, I didn't see any messages like that, so I was left confused as to why this wasn't a bigger deal. But with almost every activity exhausted in this introductory area, I found myself ready to go to the proving. The entire game has built up to this moment. It's roughly 90 minutes to two hours in, depending on how long you explored and hunted in this base area. You're ready for the next step. So you head up to the Nora tribe's base and speak with Rost, who's been really weird for the last day or two. Maybe it's that he feels as though his girl has finally grown up, or there's something else that he knows and isn't sharing. Whatever it is, it's not really clear. What he does say is that he's leaving on the day of the proving. It's not really clear why he says that he can't be here and that it's up to Aloy now. I don't care what anyone says. This is kind of a dick move. On what is perhaps the most important day of her life when she needs the most support she's ever had, you choose to walk away because you're sad or, or frustrated or something. It just doesn't make sense at all. It seems like a strange, tough love type of thing, but either way, it, it's just selfish as far as I am concerned. Perhaps he had knowledge of what was to come in the coming hour or so of gameplay and what was about to happen, but if that's the case, why wouldn't he tell Aloy? That's even weirder. But nonetheless, Rost leaves and Aloy enters the Nora encampment by herself for the first time. She's initially treated poorly, but eventually a priestess comes and welcomes her in. It's the first time that she's been greeted and treated as an equal, at least by somebody of the Nora tribe. It's official. The Eve of the Proving has begun. Now this section is actually fairly bizarre as far as I'm concerned. It's like the developers were trying to make the player feel as though they related to Aloy in the sense that they don't really relate to anybody that they're around. They don't understand what's going on completely. They make them feel like an outsider, but as far as I'm concerned, making the player feel like an outsider, while an interesting ploy, is going to do just that make them feel awkward, uncomfortable, and it leaves this whole sequence feeling fairly incomplete and strange. This is made even worse with some characters that you meet and have conversations with, namely a character by the name of Olin. To be completely honest, this guy is pretty cringy. I don't know if it's just because this is one of the first times you have a detailed conversation with somebody and the uncanny valley issues that are all over the place in Horizon Zero Dawn really start to rear their ugly head in this particular instance, but whatever it is, this whole interaction with Olin is strange, cringy, and uncomfortable. Now here we're also given the chance to make branching narrative decisions, and they give the player the option to make multiple choices as to how they want to respond to what Olin is saying. This also comes up multiple other times during this sequence, for instance when you're talking to other characters about the next day, in other words the proving, and how you currently are feeling about everything that's going on. You may initially think that your response to this is going to have some impact on the proving. For instance, if you have a really caring and understanding approach to everybody around you, perhaps when you find yourself in a rough spot during the proving, they're going to help you out or give you the benefit of the doubt since you gave that to them. Or perhaps if you're very negative and dismissive towards them, because after all, that's what they've been towards Aloy her entire life, maybe they respond in a similar way during the proving. They could do things such as making your platforming more difficult by eliminating different paths that you would be able to travel down if you had made other choices during these conversations. To me, these seem like fairly easy things to implement in a game that is prompting the player to make choices that are emotionally relevant to the situation at hand. However, none of this happens at all. All of these choices have almost no impact as far as I can tell, and the reason I say almost is because it's possible there are some lines that change that I just wasn't able to come across during my testing and playthroughs. But as far as I can tell, no one else online is able to come to any sort of clear conclusion as to whether or not these branching narrative choices actually have any real effect and cause the story to branch whatsoever. Without a doubt, the story itself carries through from point A to point B all the way through to Z without any alteration, no matter what choices you make. 
The only thing that might change are certain conversations or relationships that you have with characters that you encounter. Probably though, my clearest and most forceful point would be that if it's not clear or easy to determine whether or not a choice has some sort of effect on the world, even after multiple playthroughs, that probably means that even if there was some sort of impact and differentiation based on your choice, it wasn't clear enough whatsoever. In which case, why is it even present to begin with? To me, it seems as though these dialogue choices have much more to do with seeing the player's mental state clarified and resolved rather than actually branching the narrative based on that choice. In other words, it forces the player to reflect on what the player thinks of a given situation. When those kids threw rocks at Aloy when she was young, and the player is prompted to respond in a given way, sure their choice is going to lead to Aloy responding in some way that's going to alter the cutscene that immediately follows. But there's no long-term effect based on this choice. Rather, it forces the player to reflect on how they would respond to this situation and how their emotions would come into play. And to be honest, that's actually a pretty interesting way of forcing introspection onto the player, but I don't think that it's worth it. In my mind, if you're going to prompt the player to make branching dialogue choices, those choices should have some sort of impact. We all went after Fallout 4 because it prompted players to make choices in dialogue sequences that didn't actually have any sort of different outcome based on what you chose. In many cases, it was three options that said yes and another option that was maybe. And if you press the maybe option, it just led you into another situation where all four of your choices were to say yes. That is not an RPG, no matter how clever or carefully disguised it is. If you're going to try and give the player the ability to role play as a character, you need to follow it through. And to be honest, when I first played Horizon Zero Dawn back in 2017, and I saw these branching dialogue choices, I thought that this could be a really cool system. However, after just a few hours with the game, it became so clear to me that these choices didn't have any real impact whatsoever on the story, the world, or the characters, and I resigned myself to the belief that this was actually a late addition or a feature that was completely forgotten about during development and gutted as a result. Without a doubt, this is something I hope to see adjusted and addressed in the sequel. Whenever we end up in a situation where there's a feature that could be completely cut from a game with no impact on the game itself, I, I think that it needs to be addressed. Regardless, you go through some ceremonial BS to prepare yourself for the proving, you rest, get a good night's sleep, and then the proving begins the next day. This whole ceremony is pretty straightforward. It basically involves the individual that's participating in the event going through a fairly complicated and elaborate ninja warrior course eventually coming into a field where a bunch of grazing machines were hanging out where you have to hunt one down take the heart and get it across a threshold in order to be declared the victor it's pretty straightforward but considering how everybody in the village is talking about it in the day leading up to the event you would have thought this was the hunger games and it might as well have been because at the very end of the proving as aloy wins after taking a few shortcuts and risks along the way there's an ambush a bunch of explosions and these strange people come out and start firing on all of the kids this is our first introduction to human combat and it's pretty straightforward basically being entirely comprised of ranged shots on people that are raised above an arena that the player is located within. It's a pretty crazy event, all things considered, and it eventually climaxes in the big brute that seems to be in charge, coming up to Aloy, taking her by the neck, and almost killing her. They prepare an explosion for some reason, and Rost intervenes out of nowhere, sacrificing himself in order to save Aloy. Rost is killed, Aloy falls into a bunch of trees and snow, and the screen goes black. Aloy wakes up within the mountain itself, surrounded by all of the priestesses that were fairly rude to her earlier on the previous day. 
And when I say previous day, I mean the day before the proving. It's actually been a hot minute since the proving and Aloy's been passed out healing up. You see, the fact that Aloy was allowed within the All Mothers Mountain is actually pretty important. This is a sacred place. Think Old Testament temple. It's not a place that a regular person can just go into. It's considered sacred. The only people allowed in here are those that are carefully selected, have done years of training and penance. It, it's not a place that an outcast would be welcomed into. And the fact that she's allowed in here to heal is a pretty important element to consider. And it actually is explained away within the first five or so minutes that you're within the mountain. There's really no mystery here. They pretty much immediately tell you that when Aloy was found, she was left out on this area right in front of a massive door within the mountain itself with no explanation. As far as they know, she wasn't born, there wasn't a mother, there wasn't a father, she just appeared which made them believe that she was either some sort of divine gift or a curse. And they initially thought curse, which is why she was excommunicated from the group, pushed out of the tribe, and forced to live her entire young life as an outcast. However, after an explosion and a bunch of dead kids, they decided to reevaluate that decision. While one of the priestesses is still convinced that Aloy is bad news, the others are convinced that she actually could be a gift and could be the solution to all of their problems. I know, I know, it's a mighty convenient change of heart to have, especially in the opening hours of a video game, when you're trying to make a character seem as though they have all of these capabilities and things going for them. I mean, I know it's kind of a, like a side point and it's not really relevant, but when are we going to get the game where you're playing as somebody who has like no special abilities, is totally incompetent, you have no reason to enjoy going through this story with them and they're just painfully unlikable. Like, when is that going to happen? I mean, I could nitpick all of these motivations of the priestesses and the weird religion and matriarchal society that they have going on here. I could point out that it doesn't really make sense that they would refuse to worship this strange alien demon angel baby that just appeared within a mountain out of nowhere in front of the voice and disembodied individual that exists within the mountain itself that they worship day in day out I, I could point out that it doesn't make any sense that they, they don't worship that individual or think that she is some sort of divine gift but at the end of the day these opening hours aren't actually that important and what they mainly serve to do is get the player hyped up interested in this world and what's going on and specifically Aloy's role within that world and that's really where it stops. And to carry this point home, this is when the gameplay really starts to pick up and they introduce a lot of more complicated and difficult machines for you to fight. Namely, a machine by the name of a demon comes out of nowhere and starts to just totally demolish everybody in the village. Now, in terms of combat in this particular instance, it's actually pretty difficult to get in close with this robot but once you're up close melee does seem to be a bit overpowered here specifically because if you land a heavy swing after a couple hits it's actually going to knock the demon on the ground allowing you to get in a few more melee hits which have increased damage once the machine is down perhaps it's completely intentional to reward the player for getting up close taking that brave step and putting themselves within harm's way Whatever you could do to justify it is fine. My only point is the clear way to take on a demon in this particular point of the game is to get up close and personal, whack him with your stick, and carry on like nothing happened. That sounded super sexual. I didn't mean it to be. I mean, I sort of did, but uh, moving on. And this is when the game really opens up. Because what happens is that those priestesses that you just got done speaking with decide that you are going to be their representative to go out into the world, into the wastes, and save basically the world. This means you're finally allowed to leave the starting area. You get to go out into the big, huge world that Guerrilla Games has designed and explore it to your heart's content. Really, this is where the game actually starts, because you get to actually do whatever you want. 
Yes, the player is probably going to be fairly motivated to carry on the main quest, but it's not pressing in the same way that is, for instance, it is in Fallout 4, where you're hunting for your abandoned baby child that could be out there all alone after being stolen by a stranger. In a situation like that, the player is going to rush through the main story if they're actually role-playing and in the mind of the character because they want to find their missing child. But in this particular instance, yes there's people to hunt down yes there's stuff to do but it's not actually that pressing if you want to spend a couple in-game days traveling around hunting and gathering resources upgrading gear doing anything like that it's fine and it makes sense in the story it doesn't make Aloy a bad person just because she wanted to go and explore the world that she just gained access to in the same way that the player has just gained access to this massive world out in front of them. Again, I love it when games do this. They make the player and the character have similar emotions at the same time, experience things together. I think it's so cool. And this is one such instance when it works really well because the player wants to explore, get to know this world, see everything and the character also wants that. Now I could go through in detail the rest of the story from start to finish, explaining all of the characters that you meet along the way, how the world got to be in the case and situation that it's in now, how the world ended, how these ro weird robot machines came into being and how they emulate naturalistic creatures that currently exist on the planet today. I could go through all of that and there are actually answers that have been written into the story to explain all of that, and it's actually relatively well done. I'm not saying it's perfect and free of plot holes, because there definitely are some things that are pretty obvious, such as claiming that these robots that initially caused the downfall of humanity were created by a massive corporation that was trying to actually help the world at the same time as they were designing robots that gained all energy by way of biomass. In other words, with living organisms and they gave these robots the ability to feed and gain energy that way, not foreseeing the potential downside that could eventually happen if those robots were to grow in numbers and eventually blow up completely out of their control. But to be honest, if this world seems interesting, you should play the game and experience this story for yourself. I've gone through the opening hours to set everything up, but at the end of the day, it's up to you to engage with this story figure out what's going on and play it for yourself. In some games, I'll go through the entire thing start to finish, such as the five hour critique we did for The Last of Us Part Two. However, in this particular instance, I don't think it's that important. But altogether, I think that the story of Horizon Zero Dawn serves its purpose. It gives the player a reason to explore the world and interact with the characters that you come across, but it doesn't actually hinder the exploration or gameplay in any notable way. The player can go on exploring, hunting, destroying, doing whatever they want to do, and it doesn't have a negative or ludonarrative dissonant impact on the story itself. The performances by the voice actors are all fairly well done. There are some weird things that go on with the lip syncing, especially on secondary characters, where they all look like they're Muppets from the 1970s. It, it's really strange. It, it looks as though they patched out a lot of this stuff and improved it post-launch since I played it more recently after having played it at launch as well. But all told, there's still some really bizarre lip sync issues and some uncanny valley situations that you will come across throughout the course of the story. It's nothing too severe and it's nothing that's going to destroy your time with the game or make you hate it, but it's something I would like to see addressed in the sequel. But with the story having served its purpose and doing its job effectively, that brings us to probably the most important question of all, which is... What exactly is this game? If it's not a narrative game, if it's not an RPG, if it's not a purely adventure-based game, what is it? What exactly is Horizon Zero Dawn? You see, it tries to be an adventure game, but it was advertised as an open-world RPG. I mean, both can coexist, but the problem is that 
Horizon Zero Dawn doesn't do either of these things well, or perhaps I should say exceptionally well. If we're going to evaluate whether or not this game fits into the mold of an action-adventure game, we have to ask a few basic questions. Chief among them would be what makes an action-adventure game work? Well, I would say for one, it has to have a world that is somewhat open that the player can explore. Beyond this, you have to have balanced world density. The best example of this would be in The Witcher 3, where the developers openly spoke about the 30-second rule that they used to populate the world with items and points of interest. In other words, every 30 seconds or so as you explore the world of The Witcher 3, the designers aimed to have something interesting capture your attention and take your focus off of whatever you were doing previously. This could be something as simple as seeing a flock of seagulls flying off of the coast, or it could be a bear that comes and starts to attack you, a bunch of bandits, or even something as simple as a landmark that catches your eye. If any open world game can maintain a density that is roughly this intense, chances are they're doing a good job and are maintaining your focus throughout. And perhaps what I would say is the most important element of open world design within a narrative action RPG adventure game such as Horizon Zero Dawn, you have to have narrative happenings that make the world feel alive. Probably the best example of this would be in Red Dead Redemption 2 with the dynamic story sequences and beats that you can come across as you explore the world. Now I know that there are probably many of you out there typing comments right now explaining why and how it's unfair for me to point to these games as direct comparisons because Horizon Zero Dawn is a different game entirely and shouldn't be judged directly against them. However, I don't think that that's fair. These games that I've described, everything from The Witcher 3 to Red Dead Redemption 2 to even other games that I haven't mentioned specifically, such as Breath of the Wild and Skyrim, all of these games have fantastic open world, adventure, and even RPG elements that set the standard moving forward. If we're not going to compare a game that's trying to do something against a game that did it very, very well, What's the point of even evaluating a game in the first place? The point is, I think it's fair to compare a game against the best in the business, namely the best games that are attempting to do and succeeding in the very things that this game in question is trying to accomplish. My main point is that Horizon Zero Dawn doesn't do any of these aforementioned things properly or to an extent anywhere near that of these predecessors. Or I guess in the case of Red Dead Redemption 2, it's a game that came out after the launch of Horizon Zero Dawn, but uh, you, you get what I'm saying. You see, Horizon Zero Dawn actually follows a 30 second rule in general, but it uses animals and bot encounters to do it, which in my opinion is far less interesting than the other thing that the game needs desperately, which is more narrative and dynamic encounters that relate to the story. Early on, there's a few quests that you can encounter as you run throughout the world while exploring, but usually the quests that you will engage with are clearly marked on your map and don't involve too much adventure in order to find them. More broadly, Horizon Zero Dawn just is missing that magical drive to explore that certain games are able to nail so effortlessly. It's something that Bethesda Game Studios is fantastic at. They can craft a world that you want to explore simply for sake of exploring it. Whether you look at Skyrim, Fallout 3, or even Fallout 4, these are all games that are very well constructed in the way that the world is laid out to the extent where people can lose themselves in that world for hours and hours on end, ignoring any sort of main quest or storyline that might be bugging them at the time. Now there are of course a lot of pieces that go into Bethesda Game Studios' fantastic open world design. In fact, it's something that I could spend hours and hours breaking down if that were the subject of the video. In this case, it's not. If you want to see a full breakdown of Bethesda Game Studios' open world design, let me know in the comment section below. I'd be happy to make that video. In fact, I think I would probably find it incredibly interesting, but again, that's not the point of this video. The point is that Horizon Zero Dawn's world, while interesting in certain elements when you find an old dilapidated building that has an eerie resemblance to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs or anything else that might pique your interest if you know the area, in general, the world feels as though it is 
only there to host robots that you're supposed to fight. The world itself doesn't feel like an asset to the game or a character itself. It's simply a vessel to hold everything else that the game does, in its defense, have going for it. But with all of that said, we also have to ask whether or not this game is able to accomplish its goal of being an RPG. I can't stress enough just how many times during the pre-release marketing, they mentioned that this game was a role-playing game, that there were branching choices, there were different weapon types and modifications that you could do based on your playstyle, and that there was also potentially even character development as the story progressed from beginning to end. And I'm sure you're already aware after listening to me ramble for the last however long this video has been, the game doesn't have branching narrative choices. You can make choices that might be called back on in a conversation a little bit later, but it doesn't have any real impact on the story. The characters don't have massively different outcomes. In general, the choices you make are simply there to make you, the player, feel differently about your situation. Nothing more. When it comes to weapon types, it is true that there are different types of bows, slings, or traps that you can use in a given situation. Some people will, of course, find themselves preferring certain weapons over the others. But in my experience, as you go throughout the game and gain in your wealth and leveling, the more rare the weapon is, the better it's going to be. The weapon slots that you can fill in with different perks and abilities, those are fairly straightforward. And in general, you just are going to min-max using basic things that you acquire while exploring the world and killing massive robots that you would kill anyways. The combat controls exceptionally well, and some different weapons have a notably different feel, specifically in their aiming. Slings feel way different than a bow or any other type of weapon that you might be using. Melee is straightforward and requires very little effort on the part of the player. You basically get close to a machine and then whack it until it's dead. The dodge button to me feels incredibly overpowered and in general feels, at least again to me, as though it was the get out of jail free card on the part of the developers for sloppy animations and hitbox issues that you will find all over the place in this game. Robots swing and splash and move chaotically and erratically in every single fight that you will come across. Part of the issue with the melee combat system in this game is that you have to get up close, directly in front of, next to, or behind a machine in order to make contact. I know that sounds incredibly obvious given that we're discussing melee combat, but I think it's important to stress just how close you have to be to these machines because that means that the hitboxes are also going to be incredibly important. If the player can't reliably estimate whether or not they're going to be struck or receive damage as the result of a particular action or movement, there's no reason for them to go in and engage in melee combat because there's no way for them to know whether or not that's a safe choice to make. In which case you'll find yourself just engaging in a ranged manner, not bothering with getting close because if it's unpredictable, it feels unfair. And if a game is unfair, it's unfun. All of the robots do have weak points and weak spots that you should target. And in most cases, the bots will have different weaknesses and vulnerabilities based on the weak point that you're targeting. One weak point on a sawtooth, for instance, may be weak towards blunt damage, while another part might be weak to fire. This encourages the player to often swap between weapons to find the effect that's going to have the greatest impact on the weak point that's being targeted at that given moment. However, the downside of this is that when every single weak point has its own vulnerability, it does encourage you to swap weapons, but it also means that there's very little reason for you to fall in love with a given weapon or play style. You always are swapping weapons, always moving and adjusting your strategies based on the robot that you're taking on. Now, I feel it's important to stress, I don't think that this is a problem. For a game to encourage the player to engage with multiple different weapons and styles of gameplay, that's great. I have no issue with that. I'm just merely pointing out that if you're going to have the player choose one way of attacking a monster or one particular style of combat or weapon that they're using, it doesn't work as well when you have robots that require multiple different weapons and play styles in order to take them on effectively. And then of course this is compounded when you add in a herd of different robots, when you're taking on three, four, or five different types of machines, all 
bullet ones and you just start flinging any ammunition that you have on you at any moving object that you can see. And that is probably my biggest criticism of Horizon Zero Dawn, which is that the combat itself tends to devolve into a chaotic mess, a scramble trying to unload as much ammo as you possibly can gather on any robot that you encounter during a major sequence in the main story or just exploring trying to gather resources. I've played the game on the hardest difficulties, I've played the game on the easiest difficulty, and as far as I can tell, in general, ammo is a precious commodity and it's something that you should cherish on the harder difficulties especially. Perhaps the best way that I can describe this is by saying that Horizon Zero Dawn, especially in the trailers, made its combat seem as though it was an elegant dance between Aloy and the monsters that she was hunting. There was careful dodging, an almost balletic avoidance of damage and attacks by way of the monsters that she was taking on, and every time she took a shot with her bow and arrow, it was calculated, carefully aligned, and did massive damage to take down this beast that she to be perfectly honest, has no right taking down. And it's in that underdog battle that the game's combat really shines. When the player feels that way, it's phenomenal. The problem is, often it just feels like a chaotic mad dash instead of this elegant dance which I hope to see addressed in the sequel. I think there's a few ways you could address it. For one, allowing the player to choose weapons that they can specialize in. Two, making sure that the hitbox issues are fixed and everything feels fair so that the player is comfortable getting up close and personal without having to worry about any sort of unfair damage being dealt. And then I think you also have to address the element of the beast's designs, where every element of them has some sort of weak point attached to it and each of those weak points have a different ultimate weakness in terms of effect. If players are going to specialize in weaponry that inflicts fire damage, you need to make sure that that build is just as capable of taking on all of the biggest monsters as the person that might have a build that specializes in blunt damage, or perhaps in melee damage, or trap setting, or anything else like that. But all of this is to say, that Horizon Zero Dawn is a fantastic game that does a lot of things really, really well. However, there's other elements, such as the combat, which leaves a little bit to be desired, namely, that it feels as though it isn't fully fleshed out. At the time the game launched, I gave it a solid B. I thought it was well above average, but it didn't do anything amazingly well. However, I also said that the sequel was likely going to be the game that changed everything. Gorilla likely has ironed out all of the bugs, issues, and difficulties that they had while figuring out how this original game was going to work. And now that those issues are ironed out, they're set up to do something truly amazing. Now, we don't know much about the sequel at the time of recording this video. We know that it's been announced. We've seen some footage of it. It's not clear whether or not it's an engine or if it's actual gameplay footage taken off of the PS5. We really don't know much of anything about it. However, I'm still excited. Horizon Zero Dawn was a truly impressive game for the time that it launched. However, there were still many things that needed adjustment and that needed to be addressed, and that's exactly what they plan to do with the sequel. Now I've got, of course, my typical laundry list of wishes, hopes, and desires, things that I pray they add in, such as complete free climbing, so that we don't end up with this weird anchor tide climbing system where you have to find yellow nubs. Like, it, it's just so outdated. I really hope they fix this, to be perfectly honest. I would also love for there to be a lot more verticality in the world design. For instance, the ability to over ride and fly with a pterodactyl bot I think would be super awesome. I would also love to see Aloy pair with characters that she actually likes and has interesting relationships with. We really didn't get to see much of that in this game because in general Aloy was always moving from one group to the next. She was a nomad in many cases and the only people that she had extended periods of time where she was communicating with them were people that she was either only interacting with because they had something that she needed or they were integral to the main story and so they kind of had to be there or they were villains. There really wasn't anybody that Aloy interacted with for an extended period of 
of time that the player grew to know and really appreciate. There were some that you would encounter, speak with a few hours later in game, but really nothing on the level of pairing a character with another to go through quests and missions together with. There's of course Mr. Goatee, which most people are probably going to point out as the most obvious example of an individual that's paired with Aloy for these quests, but he for the most part is out of the picture within the first five to ten hours of the game and by the end he's almost a complete afterthought so I'm going to dismiss him but I do think that that's fair to bring up if you're going to and perhaps I'm just a ninny for bringing this up but I would love to see a wider variety of weapons I understand that a lot of people love the bow and arrow but to see Almost anything else would be refreshing. I haven't gotten my hands on a PS5 yet, so I don't know if the controller is going to be different or controlling in general with these types of aiming systems is going to feel any better, but I, as a gamer, as an individual, tend to find myself very frustrated with bow and arrows in video games. I don't know what it is, I don't know why, but whether you're playing something such as Assassin's Creed or The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild or really any other game that involves a bow and arrow, I find myself always wishing that I had an alternative. But as I said, this is just me. Maybe I'm totally outside of my mind and I'm just weird. I don't know. Let me know if you have any sort of weird eccentric preferences or distastes. I would be interested in hearing about them. But with all that said, I want to hear what you would like to see in the sequel, what you want to see Gorilla bring to the table. Because at the end of the day, this game is about improving on what was established. So if you have a clever idea, throw it down in the chat. I, I would love to see it. Going in that same vein, there's been multiple times when I've spoken with developers over at Ubisoft or CD Projekt Red or any other numerous studios who have said that they actually watch the channel here and view the comments and see the suggestions and thoughts that the community has about the game that they are either working on, have worked on, or will be working on in the future. The community down here in the comment section and on the Discord and on my Twitter, all of that is something truly special. The developers are watching, they're seeing, and they listen to you. So don't discount the value of a comment, truly. But that does it for me. Thank you for watching Honestly and Truly. I can't wait for the sequel, and I'm sure you can't either. So make sure to subscribe, like the video, so you see all of my content that comes out when that game eventually launches. I love you all more than you could possibly know. And I'll see you in the next video.